Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We had a great Easter last week, and so, so happy to see so many of you joining us. Real quick, I am going to give you the three points for my message today, uh, and that is uh, Jesus has an upside down view of now, Jesus has an upside down view of status, and Jesus has an upside down view of strength. Uh, so before I get into all that, I just want to give you a few announcements and just give me a second right here to get these things ready and, uh, and share these with you. And, and so, um, uh, first of all, we'd like you to see that, and I'm getting everything ready here. Hold on. Um, we'd like you to see that our service times have changed a little bit. Uh, we have our Facebook Live at 9 a.m. You're watching that right now. And at 10 a.m., we are in person here live. And we have small groups during the week. If you would like to give the First Assembly, you could do a cash or check and give that to uh, First Assembly of God. Uh, make your checks payable to that. If you would like to give online, uh, that is katemayfirstassembly.org forward slash donate. Or you could text to give, which is the easiest way. You text the word give to 609 400 So I'd like to get started today and just talk about uh, the timing of of Jesus and how his timing is different than ours. Uh, have you ever noticed that God's timing is not the same <laughs> as our timing? We often really want God to do um, stuff really fast, right? And we're going through things and we find that Jesus really doesn't have the timing that we do. I'd like to talk about that. And this is um, a, uh, a message that's found in the book of Mark. And uh, I'd like to just share it with you this morning. And there go. I'm doing all the computer stuff while I'm talking to you. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a jack of all trades here. Uh, so <laughs> uh, here we are. We're in the book of Mark. And uh, just like to uh, share this with you today. Um, and the title of my message is The Strange Timing of Jesus. And that is Mark 5, 21 through 43. And I already went through these points with you. I'll just take my face off of there so I could show you this again. And, uh, and I'd like to just share this with you. I'm in Mark 5, uh, 21 through 43. And it says, uh, and I'm going to read this to you. And when Jesus had crossed again, uh, in the boat, the in the boat to the other side of the to the other side, a great ca crowd gathered around him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet, and implored him earnestly, saying, "My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she." may live, I'll take my face off of there, may live, uh, may be well and live. And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him and the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power had gone out from him, immediately turned about the crowd and said, who is touched? Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter, 
James and John and the brother, the brother of James. They came into the house, the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw, saw a commotion of people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him because he put them all outside and took the child um, excuse me, and they laughed at him, but he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother, whose, those who were with him, and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumai, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years old of age, and they they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. So, um, just want to tell you, like most of the time when I was growing up, uh, there was stories, usually if there was a sermon on healing, it usually was a story of the woman that touched him. We would hear that sermon a lot. And then other times we would hear the story about Jairus the, uh, and his daughter. But I want you to see something, that these stories are meant to be together. They are a story. This is one story. This is not two separate stories, and this is really important. And, and the first thing I want you to see is this. Jesus has an upside-down view of now. Um, what, what, what is done here is really, um, would be considered, if Jesus were a doctor, this would be considered malpractice, uh, because here's what happened. Jesus comes from this miracle on the other side where he has, uh, complete control over these demons. He goes to the other side of the lake and he's met, and you, you get a lot of this in Mark where people are just running up to him. But here's what happened. Jesus is met by this synagogue ruler, uh, the, and, and many of the people that he would have problems with, like the, the, the wealthy religious elite. But this man comes to him and just begs him to come. And he says, my daughter is about to die. She's at the point of death. I need you to come now. And so they're going and they're moving and the crowd is all around him. And this woman touches him and he feels healing go out from it, from him. And Jesus stops and he looks for the woman. Now, I want you to see what's going on here. Jairus is thinking, my daughter is about to die, and the thing that is, uh, that, that is scaring him the most is the fact that his daughter could die at any moment. Put yourself in this situation right now. People are just crowding around Jesus. People are touching him, and Jesus stops, and he says, someone touched me. I need to talk to that person, and so Jesus uh can never be in a hurry. Do you know that? Uh, Jesus is never going to serve us on our timetable because Jesus knows that there are more important things. There was more important things for Jairus in this situation. See, um, the reason why Jesus never functions on our timetable is because serving Jesus will get us more than we ask for and at the same time, will require more from us than we think, right? So here's Jairus. He is um, going, and he's saying, please come. This is an emergency. I need you right now. And Jesus is coming, and he stops. He's not in a hurry. What, what's Jairus going to do now? Well, Jairus was believing Jesus he was, he was trying to have faith for a miracle. But the faith he was trying to have a miracle for was the healing of a fever. But now Jairus was going to actually have to believe Jesus to raise the dead for a resurrection. This woman, uh, she said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just touch him and I'm going to get out of here. Right, like she didn't want him to notice her. She she didn't want to to be acknowledged by him. And yet, when she touches him, he stops and he talks to her. See, because Jesus wasn't just interested in Jairus believing him for uh, a miracle. Jesus wanted Jairus to see him as someone 
who can conquer death. He wasn't just interested in this woman getting a healing. He was interested in this woman becoming a disciple. He was interested in her very soul, who she was. And so, he has to stop and disciple her. So, I love this story about Jesus because Jesus is never in a hurry. Uh, this speaks to me a lot as a pastor because I think there's always people in my situation, and you know you're in this situation too, if you're a parent, if you're a doctor, if you're a police officer, if you're just a teacher, uh, I didn't mean just a teacher, but if, if you're a teacher, if you work at a job, right, there's always these things that come up that want to uh, take away our time, right? And, and, they, and, and life always wants to hurry us. And one of the great things we can do in God is to slow ourselves down, right? And Jesus is always slowing things down. He is not on the timetable of everyone else. And so it's frustrating when people aren't on your, on your timetable. And it's really frustrating when God is not on your timetable. But the reason why God is not on your timetable is because he expects more from you and he wants to give you more than what you're asking for. Jesus didn't want to just give this woman a healing. He wanted to give her new life. Jesus didn't want to just give Jairus an opportunity to see a healing of a fever. He wanted Jairus to see that Jesus is in control of life and death. So, I'll take you quickly to my second point today, and that is this. Jesus has an upside-down view of status. Jesus has an upside-down view of status. We first said Jesus has an upside-down view of time, right? We, we are always in a hurry. We got to get it done now, but that's not the way Jesus thinks. See, because Jesus, um, to Jesus, death and a fever are the same thing because he has the power to overcome those things. But he also has an upside-down view of status. See, when Jairus came to Jesus, I'm sure his disciples were saying, oh, this is good for us. You know, Jesus is going to heal this guy's daughter, and now the religious leaders and the religious figures are going to see Jesus in a different way. Jairus was rich. Jairus was a ruler. Jairus was educated. Um, and, and that's not to mean that Jesus despised him because of these things. But Jesus wasn't going to be manipulated into something because Jesus, because Jairus had status, Jairus had money, Jairus had position. This woman, on the other hand, the scripture says she had spent all her money on doctors. And, and so this woman was poor. Uh, this woman had an issue of blood, which would have meant in, in biblical times, in, in, the, in the Jewish culture, uh, that she would have been considered unclean. Uh, a person who was bleeding could not enter in to worship. See, to enter into worship in the temple, it dealt with um, cleanliness, cl excuse me, cleanly, cleanliness, and uh, and it dealt with um, you know to get close to God, you need you need it to be clean, uh, not just clean in your body, but you did sacrifices to be clean in your spirit as well, to be right before God, right? So to be holy before God, you couldn't come into God with an issue of bleeding. So this woman was not only um, poor, but she was put outside, right? And so she would not be someone whom uh, someone would touch. This is why she said, well, if I just touch the edge of his garment, right? Because no one would touch her. She, she thought to herself, if I ask Jesus for a healing, he will, he will get away from me because there's no way a rabbi who's powerful would want to be unclean by touching me. And, you know, here's the beautiful thing. Uh, when everyone else touched that woman, they became dirty, right? They became unclean. But when Jesus touched her, she became clean, right? And she became clean because what Jesus was doing all throughout his ministry was taking on our dirt, taking on our uncleanness. And, he, and, and at that moment, he's taken on her uncleanness so that she could be set free. And so Jesus had a different view of status. He wasn't going to say, hey, I'm sorry. Um, it's really important that I take care of this guy's daughter. This woman, this is so important. This woman had a chronic condition, but 
Jairus had an emergency condition, right? Jairus had a, a, a condition that needed to be dealt with right away. And so not only did he have that, but he had status, right? So it would have been completely acceptable for Jesus to look at this woman and say, stay right here. I'll be right back. I'm going to take care of this, this, uh, this girl, right? Not only is she in a condition where she can die at any moment, but uh, this guy has power, prestige, and money, all the things you would think that the ministry of Jesus needed, and yet he wasn't concerned about that. He wasn't concerned about status, and uh, he wasn't concerned about money. He wasn't concerned about power. He was concerned about this woman and who she was and what she was going through. Uh, and so Jesus has an upside-down view of status. Thirdly, I want you to see this. Jesus has an upside-down view of strength. Jesus has an upside-down view of strength. What I mean by this is uh, the wording in this is really interesting because it says that he felt power go out from him, right? So Jesus, um, there, there's these contrast of strength in, in Jesus because Jesus as a man felt power go out from him. He, he became weak, right? He became tired, right? He was more tired than when he what he was before this woman touched him. And yet when he when he goes and sees Jairus's little girl, it's a it's really a beautiful story by the way, and just this this picture. Um, he took this time, right, to speak with this woman. Power goes out from a, out out from him. He becomes weak. Right? But then Jairus says, uh, you know, you know, Jairus is obviously like, hey, we need to get going here. And someone says, hey, don't bother him. And this is the moment that Jairus' Jairus's worst fear was realized. I know he was thinking, if we don't get there soon, my little girl's going to die. And then someone comes and says, it's too late. There, there's no reason for Jesus to come now. Imagine the, the, the feelings that Jairus must have had. Like if he just didn't stop, we would have we made it on time. And then Jesus says, it's okay, just believe he goes to the house and people are mourning. And he says, why are you mourning? Um, you know, it sounds like Jesus is kind of lying here, right? He's like, oh, she's not dead. She's asleep. But he's not saying a lie. What he's saying is to him, death is just sleep. Um, and we just celebrated that last week, right? That Jesus conquered death. Well, this is the first time uh, we're starting to see that Jesus has power over death. And he goes in and the wording here is really interesting. The, um, he says this, this phrase, um, little girl, which is translated little girl. But this is a phrase of um, endearment. It, it's hard for us to kind of get the translation, but it's kind of like saying honey, sweetie, right? He's giving this little term, term of endearment. Think about the God of the universe, and, and this amazing God that has created everything uh, has become a man uh, and, uh, and, and is living among us and just has the heart. This is the heart of God. He just looks at this little girl and he says to her, hey, sweetie, hey, honey, get up. You know, we have uh, instances of this in the Old Testament, like Elijah, where he goes in to a little boy who died. And Elijah has to spread himself over the boy and cry out to God and pray and pray and spread himself over the boy. And, and then finally the boy gets life in him and God does this miracle. Jesus doesn't have to do any of that. We talked about this before. Jesus has, doesn't have to do like these cantations. He doesn't have to do these long prayers. He doesn't have to do any of this. He simply says, get up. And he says, little girl, get up. And the little girl gets up. So we see this immense power of Jesus. And yet at the same time, when this woman touched him, he became weak. And this is what Jesus Christ has ultimately done for us. He went to the place of weakness so that we could experience his strength. And it was in the weakness. It was in the cross. It was in there that, we, that he experienced uh, that ultimate weakness 
and ultimately was raised up by God. That was his crowning moment. You know, Jesus speaks all through the book of Mark on this idea of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. And and he says things like, if the Son of Man be lifted up, this is king, uh, this is kingship language. If the Son of Man is lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And so they're on their way to Jerusalem. They're getting ready to go to Jerusalem. And, and they're like, okay, we're going to lift up Jesus. But Jesus gets lifted up. His crowning moment, the moment he becomes king, is on the cross where he's giving up his life. He's, he's received the crown. He's given a crown. He's given a robe. And uh, he's lifted up on a cross in the ultimate act of weakness. And in that act of weakness, he gives us his strength. He gives us his life. He gives life through weakness. Uh, he gives up his life so that we can be strong. So let me give you some hope thoughts today. Um, some hope thoughts. Um, he loves you too much to be hurried by you. Jesus loves you, excuse me, I'm um, Jesus loves you too much to be hurried by you. I know right now you're, you're saying, uh, Jesus, I, I need you to do something for me. I need you to do it right now. I need you to hurry. I need you to do this. There's so much more Jesus wants to teach you. There's so much that he wants, so many ways he wants to impact your life, that if we let him hurry, if we let him, if he let us hurry him all the time, we wouldn't learn, we wouldn't grow. It's because of his love for us, he's not hurried by us. Remember, Jesus wants more from us and expects more from us. We're going to give more to him than we ever think we're going to give, and we're going to get more from him than we ever think we're going to get. And that's why Jesus is not hurried by any of us. Uh, secondly, um, he loves you too much to be hurried by you. He's not only, uh, he's not panicking over your situation right now. Now, I don't know how that makes you feel, um, but I have noticed that uh, sometimes I deal with people who are in a panic, and if I'm not in a panic, they get mad at me, right? Um, and and, um, and I, I think that's how we feel towards God sometimes. We're saying, God, I'm in a panic right now, and you're not panicking. But instead of getting mad at God, take comfort in that. Jesus isn't panicking over something you're going through right now. It's not even close to anything he has gone through, and it's not like he's never seen this before. So we don't have to panic. We can trust and put our faith and put our hope in him. And then finally, um, um, it is, um, oh, this still saying he's not panicking over situation? Hold on. Um, give me a minute. Okay. Uh, he is drawn to weakness. This is so beautiful. Um, do you know Jesus can't resist certain things? One of the things he can't resist is repentance. Repentance is an act of weakness. We say, God, I'm weak. I need you. Jesus can't resist that. If, you, if you're going in prayer to him and you're saying, okay, God, here's all the things I've done for you, and so therefore I need you to do these things, well, um, you know, that's, that's fine. At least you're praying. Uh, but you're not necessarily impressing God with anything. But when we come to him in weakness, he can't resist. Because that's when he gives us his power. Jesus can't resist weakness. And, and so if you want your prayers answered, and I'm not talking about in some manipulative way, I'm talking about just reality. We come to God in weakness. We admit our weakness, and in our weakness, he is strong. Well, uh, that's uh, my message from uh, the book of Mark today. So want to just thank you for joining us, and it's so great to see you. Uh, let me pray for you. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you will just uh, help us to see that your timing isn't like our timing, and whatever we're going through today, we can put our trust in you. Even death is like sleeping to you. So there's nothing that we are going through today that you cannot handle, and so we love you. We thank you. We thank you for your cross where you gave everything for us. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Well, God bless you. And if you're in the Cape May area, uh, we'd love to see you uh, today at 10 o'clock. Uh, if you are coming down to visit, please visit us. We would love to see you. God bless you. And may you have a wonderful day. Amen.